Hello, and welcome to another episode of Fleeting Science, interviews behind the scenes of the Fleet Science Center. I'm Wendy Grant, Director of Marketing and Communications, and today my guest is Daniel Ferguson, writer and director of the new giant screen film, Super Power Dogs, now playing on the giant dome screen at the Fleet Science Center. Hi, Daniel. Hello, Wendy. Thank <laughs> you for having this. an amazing space. I'm so glad you guys are doing this. I know. I don't think that the camera captures um, the shag carpeting in here. This but... room has a lot of charm actually <laughs> it is a time capsule yes it's very special <laughs> um so your film mm. superpower dogs what's it all about it is about the world's most amazing dogs who fight crime and save lives and the science behind how they do what they do that's the succinct kind of elevator pitch yeah and uh, and we deliver mm -hmm. i mean we uh, i have to say i was a bit of a skeptic going in and i was thinking gosh, you know, dogs, how do we do this in a way that's different and that, you know, isn't television and that really... Is uh, worthy of the giant absolutely. screen. Absolutely. <laughs> Otherwise, what are we doing here? So uh, I spent years researching and traveling the world, actually meeting some pretty amazing dogs, dogs who long line from helicopter in the back country of the Canadian Rockies and they dig people out of avalanches and dogs who jump out of boats and helicopters in Italy and save people from drowning and dogs in Kenya who track down poachers and bring them to justice. And so really amazing stories that I don't think we've ever seen before. My dog just naps on the couch, so I feel like he really needs to step it up. I think your dog probably has some superpowers. You know? <laughs> I don't know if they're IMAXian uh, superpowers, but you know, it's Maybe kind not. of like the Olympic athletes of the dog world. That's the way I always uh, yeah. say it, is that we treat these dogs kind of like as, as if they're as exotic as, as tigers or whales or anything like that that we're used to seeing on these screens. Yeah. And, I, and I found a way, I think, with these giant cameras to film them in such a way that elevates them and makes them into the true heroes they are. Do, 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 do. Exactly. With or without capes. <laughs> so the film follows a Dutch shepherd named Halo from being an adorable little puppy to testing to become a certified search and rescue dog. So how long did that take? How long did you film Halo and her owner? Well, I, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just going to be a grab bag of different dog stories, you know, yeah. that it wasn't too episodic, that it would have uh, a narrative throughout and you'd be able to sort of follow, to the, follow these chapters. Uh, so we start when she's 10 weeks and uh, which she actually gets picked up by her handler, her her partner, uh, whose name is Cat, and that's true, that's her real name. Uh, <laughs> and you can't ask for a better name for a dog movie. No. <laughs> uh, so Cat goes in, she picks her up, and this happened in January of 2016. Uh, we did a lot of research and we asked some of the task forces. When I say task forces, I mean groups who uh, save people in, in, in earthquakes and disasters, rather. So urban search and rescue. You know, a building collapses, they go in with the dog, the dog finds them in a fraction of a time that it would take a team of people and technology. Uh, so she's searching for a new partner. True story. She goes to uh, Detroit, Michigan, and she um, sort of chooses out of a litter. And what actually happened was that a cat came in. I met her for the first time. Uh, her, her previous dog was a yellow lab, just died of kidney failure. It was a very, very sad story. And she said, I cannot look at another yellow lab again. I need to change breeds. I need to find uh, a Dutch shepherd. So we met her. The emotion was very, very raw. We went through all these dogs. And she said, I just don't feel it. And then the last, the door opened and in walks Halo, without a name, obviously. Yeah. He was the only dog actually not wearing a little color ribbon. Uh, and they just clicked. It was pretty unbelievable. And Kat looked at me and she said, are you seeing what I'm seeing here? Because this is happening. And you watch this bond kind of develop over, over three years. So, yeah, we started in, in 2016. And we went all the way through her training to her certification exam, which is what you have to pass, a FEMA certification exam, before you can go out the door on a real disaster. I'm not going to give away the ending. Me neither. But, uh, yes, it was a long process. Yeah. Yeah. So you were right in it. So, yeah. So you took a risk, right? Because <laughs> you didn't know what was going to happen. And um, and neither neither do we. We're no, neither did Kat. I mean, I have to <laughs> yeah. say that she's an amazing um, handler and trainer. So we had a lot of hopes. But uh, Halo was a hot mess <laughs> at the beginning. So, you know, she was... We'd be filming and she'd just go after a stick or a squirrel or something. Uh, and that's what kind of makes it adorable. Because... I actually did want a story where 
uh, you know, like like Spider Man, like Peter Parker. You look at that kid, and you're like, come on, never or whatever. You know, farm boy living on Tatooine. You know, he could never save the galaxy <laughs> or something. You know, right? <laughs> and and this is the same thing. Like this dog, we say ha- has a great destiny. Uh, but you're wondering, you're like, really? And this was based on when I started doing the research, I'd go to these places where they're actually taking um, shelter dogs and training them to become search and rescue dogs. Mm. So from rescued to rescuer. Oh, nice. And and this happens in the Search Dog Foundation, actually, here in California. And, and in other places, the Working Dog Center is another one. But in any case... Uh, you know, I love this idea that you get a dog, a big slobbery jumping up on you, like no discipline, whatever. And then within a series of months or years, they become a fully fledged superhero yeah. and they can save lives. Yeah. Yeah. No phone booth change <laughs> required. I guess nowadays people don't even know what a phone booth is, right? I know. What, yeah. what is that? Yeah. Um, it's a box you would go in to make calls. Oh, gosh. Thank goodness that. <laughs> thank goodness the them. future is here. <laughs> you miss those? I do. Aww. I miss all that stuff. In fact, being in this room, this very retro '70s room, makes I, me miss all that stuff. I think that's why I'm thinking of it. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are several amazing dogs in the film, in addition to um, the fantastic Halo. But what is super exciting for us in San Diego is that there's a local dog who's in the film, um, Ricochet, sweet Ricochet. Oh, Ricochet, we love Ricochet. Yeah, tell us about Ricochet. So. You know, you have to <clears throat> remember that we've got all these incredible uh, search and rescue dogs and water rescue and, and all this action. Yes. And uh, Ricochet is kind of like an emotional rescue dog. Mm-hmm. So she saves people uh, on the same level as the other dogs, but in a very different way. And what I mean by that is uh, for, for listeners or viewers uh, who know Ricochet, you probably know that she surfs. Okay, so she's a Pretty famous cool. <laughs> surf champion. And <clears throat> when I heard about her originally, I thought, oh, come, that's got to be a kind of a gimmick or something. Yeah. She doesn't just surf for the heck of it. She clearly loves it. So her backstory is that uh, her, her partner, Judy, trained her to be a service dog. And uh, unfortunately, she had a, a proclivity to birds. She liked to chase after birds. Yes. You know, she's a real dog. So uh, she failed that or she just sort of shut down. And then Judy kind of. There's, there's a great footage of her as a young dog and Judy just screaming, Ricky, you know, as oh my gosh. Ricochet charges after birds. Yeah, and then it's, it sort of starts out. It's like, Ricochet, Ricochet. And then it's like, really like, Ricochet, get back here. You know, and I think every dog owner could probably relate to that. Totally. Or, or parent, really. You know, they just won't listen to you. And she's just tearing after those birds. And in fact, when we recorded with Chris Evans in the studio, he laughed out loud at that footage. He came to that and he was just like, it's it's true. It's authentic, you know, because yeah. so much of the film is these dogs, these sort of, you know, elite, you know, and that's I love Powerful. breaking that. Exactly. And that's why in, when we go to Africa, you know, you meet the greatest noses and they're sleeping yeah. like they're napping. You know, yeah. and I just love that kind of playing with the audience. So back to Ricochet. Uh, so Ricochet is a, a famous surf champion. She actually. Uh, I think declared uh, after she sort of failed as a service dog uh, that she wanted to surf. Mm -hmm. And I think for Judy, she always says it's the importance of being able to listen to your dog. You know, initially Judy was frustrated and what's wrong with you and what's wrong with me and all this. And then she said, wait, wait a minute. Maybe I'm just not listening to my dog. Maybe my dog is actually trying to tell me something as to what she wants to do. Okay. So she wants to surf. What do I do with that? So I enter some contests and they won some contests. And then there was um, a boy who was 14 at the time. His name's Patrick, and uh, he is uh, quadriplegic. And an incredible story, in, and you, it's featured actually in, in the book that Judy has, has written about Ricochet. Uh, and they did sort of like a tandem surf. So he was on a board, assisted board, and then Ricochet was on her board. And it was going to be a fundraiser. And you know what? Ricochet jumped off her board and jumped onto Patrick's board. And that moment became you know viral. Millions of people saw it. And uh, and then there were all these calls coming in for could I surf with Ricochet? And Ricochet began to surf with all kinds of people with special needs. And she, I think, revealed, you know, in a sense, her purpose, what she was put on this earth to do, which was to transform lives and heal people. Uh, and today, you know, she doesn't just surf, but she works with uh, veterans with uh, post-traumatic stress, uh, children with special needs, autism, all kinds of things. So. Uh, when I met her, I was just amazed, you know, that she had all these superpowers in, in sort of one body. Uh, and she's an important part of the film. My gosh, she's kind of, in a sense, uh, such a strong emotional component of the film. Yeah. And I think anyone who says dogs have a sort of sixth sense 
Um, and obviously, you know, we're here and we're here to celebrate science. And there is a lot of science behind and research on how dogs can detect our pheromones, our, our stress mm. hormones, for example. And when we're uh, acutely uh, sad or angry or something that a dog will react as if they can detect those. And so there's a lot of research about that. But Ricochet takes it to another level because Ricochet could walk into a crowd of people and go right to someone, the person who needs her the most uh, in a, cr a crowd of strangers, I should say. Yeah. So it's one thing if you have a dog, your dog knows you and knows your emotional changes. Um, and, and whether it is that we're releasing different odors or auras, whatever you want to say, and there's a lot of research about this. So I don't want to be definitive about it, but Ricochet does it on a level I have never seen before. I totally agree with that. And I, so we did a sneak peek of the film last night and had an audience here. And I've already had two people <laughs> tell me that um, one whose um, son Ricochet made a beeline for, and he had recently had to withdraw from college due to anxiety. And, you know, what a special moment uh, he had with Ricochet. And another person who just had a bad day and fell down on the way <laughs> over to coming to, to the film. And Ricochet, you know, kind of demanded that this girl pick up her paw and you know they really connected and it turned her whole day around yeah so i saw it in action it, it happened uh, here. i have to say you know ricochet has has turned me into a believer yeah. in terms of not that i i want to you know become all mystical about it but dogs have so much to teach us yeah and uh ricochet is kind of it made sense for me to structure this film, sort of start with physical and then move to sensory. So the smell and the sight and the, the hearing and everything, and then move to cognition and then instinctive superpowers. Yeah. And Ricochet has an empathetic intuition and instincts about her that, um, you know, I think we're just scratching the surface of. I don't know if we'll ever define it as to how she does what she does. Um, but the message there is very clear, is that dogs are trying to, they're always communicating with us. We just need to learn how to listen, is one of the messages. And then somehow dogs can read us or know us on a level that, um, I don't know, other humans maybe can't. Yeah, definitely. I saw it happen here. So how did Ricochet become part of the film? We, uh, you know, it's really important on these movies because you're going to spend a lot of time and money uh, going out to places and, and, and just making sure that the ex experience is extraordinary and that you have a the casting is really important is what, sure. I, what I mean to say. So research and development is critical, but I felt like I needed, um, whether it was going to be a medical detection dog, you know, a dog who works with someone with epilepsy or diabetes or something, I wanted to have that side of things like the service or an emotional support dog, but I needed something that was uh, belonging on a giant screen. You know, right. so I have to admit that the surfing aspect combined with those abilities kind of sold me. And when I found Ricochet online, uh, I just I got on a plane right away to San Diego. I came down. By the way, does this mean that you just watch dog videos as research for the That's film? That's all I did. I got paid to do that. Uh, luckiest guy in the world. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Not like <laughs> okay. that I got to travel to Italy and Kenya and, and British Columbia and all these right. places, but I got to watch dog videos. And, and it was kind of like this elaborate casting process, you know, mm. where like, and I, that's the thing. I could have made 10 or 20 movies sure. based on how many dogs there are. But um, I wanted to have a variety of breeds. I wanted to have a variety of abilities. And it's kind of like the doggy Avengers. You know, that's the, that's the way I sell it. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, because, you know, you've got uh, dogs that are like the strongest dog in the world, the most uh, sort of in tune dog. And, and, and it reminds me, and I actually, not only did I watch a lot of dog videos, but I watched all the superhero movies that I could. And, and I'm not, I'm sort of ambivalent uh, with superhero movies. You know, I've sort of had my fill. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. Um, but I recognize that it's a huge cultural phenomenon sure. and people love them. And I grew up reading comic books and everything. And so, um, you know, I, I, I enjoy them as much as the next person. I'm not a fanatic, uh, but I watch them to learn a little bit about the aesthetic and that's whole graphic novel exaggeration, the hypersaturated color palette, the camera angles, the slow motion, just where to put the camera to treat these dogs like they really are the true superheroes we know they are yeah yeah you definitely succeeded in that um okay so ricochet you saw ricochet online yeah and, and then said, i i, I came dog. down to escondido mm -hmm. um to meet in fact um i have to share something that just was very funny when we when we uh i guess it was in 2015 we met ricochet um my partner dominic who's the 
my producing partner uh, is this sort of dog whisper of our group, right? So uh-huh. for years he's been saying dogs, 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 dogs. And I've been the one saying- But he wanted to make a film about dogs. Oh yeah, yeah. he wanted to do dogs and IMAX and uh, he was the one who came up with the idea. And so when I found Ricochet online, I called Dom and he lives in Kenya. And I said, Dom, we're flying to San Diego. We're gonna, I think this might be the one in terms of the emotional support dog we were looking for. Yeah. So he flies, you know, you can imagine uh, Nairobi, Zurich, Zurich, LA or something like this. And he's been on the plane for like, you know, 20 hours or something. Gets off at, uh, I don't know why we flew into LAX. And I got him in a car and I drove him here to <laughs> yeah, like a always, Best Western. Always fly into San Diego. I people, know, okay? really. Fly into <laughs> yeah. San Diego. But he gets out and he just said, boy, you, you know how to show a guy a good time. Like, right, you know, yeah. like to fly me all around the world, come to a Best Western, you know, what are we doing in Escondido? And we go into like a Starbucks in a plaza and Dom's jet lagged and we meet Ricochet. And initially we're meeting Judy and Ricochet and she's telling us about Ricochet. And we've read her book and everything. And so we're waiting to see, you know, what is there a demo? You know, does the dog do anything? I mean, what's, boy, this is not really IMAXian uh, right now, sort of a dog lying under the table in a Starbucks. And... All of a sudden, she just perks up, her ears go up as if she's heard or smelled or something, and she just makes a beeline for um, a a gentleman sitting at another table uh, quite a distance from us, and just sits down next to him, like right on his feet, and sort of nudges him, like pet me, total stranger. And Judy looks at me and she says, you know, I'm just her guardian. I don't actually own her. I'm just her guardian on this earth. Hmm. And slowly we make our way over to this gentleman and he says to us, I got to tell you, this dog has just made my day. I have just had the worst week and I just, I don't know what it is about your dog, but it's as if she knows what I'm feeling and what I need. And then I just looked at Dominic and I said, yeah, see, it was worth coming all this way. And then, of course, we saw her with, you know, children and surfing and the whole package came together. And you guys have something special in the city in Ricochet. She is an amazing dog. Yeah, she's a real hero and we're lucky to have her. And then you filmed in San Diego, right? So if you come to see the film, you get to see our fair city on the big screen. Yes, we we filmed a a fair bit, actually. We filmed uh, on Cardiff uh, State Beach. Mm -hmm. Uh, We filmed here in Balboa Park, of course. And I have to put that scene in context, which is that uh, Ricochet, one of the things Ricochet does is uh, she works with veterans with post-traumatic stress. So uh, through the Naval Hospital here, uh, I scouted several times watching her with... Uh, veterans uh, with extreme anxiety and post-traumatic stress and on different conditions. And I was just kind of a fly on the wall. So what happens is, let's say uh, the veteran arrives, they're told, they're given a mission. So go to the tourist office and get a map. So they have to interact with people. They've got to walk through these corridors. If you've ever been to Balboa Park, of course, I'm assuming that um, your listeners, your audience has. And, uh, And people who are obviously claustrophobic, ricochet alerts, meaning she stops and she plants, she sort of forces you to stop. She actually gets right in front of you and she blocks you. Mm -hmm. And then you try and tug her leash and she will not move. And it's like her way of saying, you are in extreme anxiety right now. You're freaking out. You just stop and pet me and look into my eyes. Let's have a little bit of oxytocin released, please. You're gonna be okay. And it's sort of her way of telling you this. What's amazing though is when you're in a public context, you know, you're gonna. Your natural inclination is to say, "I'm okay. I'm fine." Like, stop it. You know, stop right. that. And, and you're embarrassing that. me. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen veteran after veteran behave that way and sort of tug on her leash. And people who are walking by, they're like, "Ah, oh, look at that stubborn dog." And it's not that at all. Right. You have to know how to sort of read the signs. So Judy would be there, and she'd say, "How are you feeling right now?" And do you feel like you need to sit down? And they'd say, "I don't know why Ricochet's doing this." And in one case. Uh, there was like a black suburban driving through this the parking area as you come out near the tourist office. And uh, Judy asked, I mean, is there something around here? And they said, well, you know, black suburbans are part of my trigger. Um, and it was just unbelievable. Like, how would Ricochet know this? That, right. you know, I, I don't want to um, imagine or take a guess, but somehow there's something going on there in the release of stress hormones, whether it's the blood pressure quickening and the heart racing, whatever it is, but that Ricochet would know almost before the veteran or the person. And in other cases, her uh, alert was totally different. You know, for, for some people, uh, the trigger would be uh, children. For some people, the children would be, the, the trigger would be like open spaces, courtyards, which would remind them of 
uh, you know, an open market or something in, in Iraq or Afghanistan. But yeah. every person was different. It wasn't like it was a formula. Right, right. Uh, so after seeing a number of veterans uh, with Ricochet, I was even more convinced. But how to kind of film that was so challenging. So I have to say it was one of my hardest days on the entire show. I mean, way harder than helicopters and boats and underwater and all the stunt work we did was the emotional part of it because it's so obscure. Like if you are not sure, you would miss it. Yeah. It's so subtle. And I wanted the audience to kind of be immersed almost into Ricochet's world. So I used the soundtrack. I used sort of the sounds and I and I filmed it in such a way that it becomes sort of from bucolic to menacing. I mean, what? I go through Balboa Park and I'm in heaven here. I just love it. I'm so relaxed. Yeah. But for a veteran who's got to come and walk through this and interact with people or be confronted with these open spaces, or whatever it is, it's it's very trying. And Ricochet seems to care so much about these people she's working with. She's invested in them. She's like worried for them. Yeah. And, you know, and I've seen people just break down. Uh, it's very, very moving because she forces you to confront uh, your own emotions uh, in a way that maybe you're not ready to. Right. Uh, so a lot of veterans might be, you know, putting on a brave front or hiding or not willing to uh, share or acknowledge what their triggers might be or their anxiety. And Ricochet kind of forces you to confront that. It's very powerful stuff. So we've got a guy in the movie... Um, Staff Sergeant uh, Griff is his name, uh, Parsons, and, and and he's an amazing guy because he's very exposed, you know, in this film, and he's so brave. He almost didn't make it, though, to, to the set. You know, he didn't come. He was very nervous. Yeah. And even to work with uh, Logan, who's this um, boy uh, with sensory, sensory processing disorder, I mean, to pair Griff with Logan and they surf together, uh, that was very, very difficult for Griff. So there's real emotion here and it's very authentic. And I'm very humbled by Judy and Ricochet and allowing us to trust them and allowing us into their lives to kind of capture this and, you know, I guess showcase Ricochet as an ambassador yeah. for for these kind of emotional support dogs. Yes, yeah, so you were able to capture that on film very, very well. And you also in the film give the audience a chance to actually sort of see the world as dogs see it. So how did you do that? Yeah, I, I wanted you to be a dog. Uh, <laughs> that's really it. So, you know, so, some of the reason is, so why does this belong in IMAX? Why should I see it on the dome? Um, well, obviously, we take you around the world and you get all this action and so forth. Yeah. And you get great science. But uh, I think it's really cool that you get to be a dog. And what I mean yeah. by that is that <laughs> we actually designed a special camera rig that sees the world in about 250 degrees. Uh, and so you could see it as this with this wide periphery, the way that a dog might see it. And then we did a lot of research. We had a lot of scientific advisors who told us that dogs see in uh, blues and yellows and grays. So uh, no greens or reds. So we took that out of the color palette. Um, the edges of vision are very blurry. So we kind of reduced that visual acuity and had some clarity in the center. Uh, and then what was even more fun was that we used the amazing sound system in, the, in your theater. Uh, to replicate the high frequencies that dogs hear. So we shift from human hearing to dog hearing. Yeah. Uh, and you can realize that, my gosh, you know, they have 18 muscles in their ears. They can swivel and hear a cry for help farther away than we could or in a fraction of the time. But their greatest superpower, if you're a detection dog, is their noses, of course. Yeah. Um, so what we did was we kind of built what we called like smell of vision or smell right. um where <laughs> that was how I was thinking of it so yeah, I'm glad that's how you I know, think of it I too. Know. Well one day we'll have like uh, the theater technology where you could actually pour out smell into the audience although smelling sweaty humans is not the most attractive thing. Probably not, yeah. Uh, but maybe for a dog it's different. In any yeah. case uh, what we did was we we actually tried to bring the dog's olfactory world to our visual one. So we're visual creatures, right? right? So uh, our brain is sort of dominated by our visual cortex uh, relative to our olfactory cortex. And in dogs, it's very much the opposite. Um, you know, the, the, the part of their brain dedicated to smell is much, much larger yeah. um, than ours. And uh, their ability to, to dissect odors as well, you know. So, I mean, I remember reading all kinds of amazing things about, you know, a dog sniffs a tree or a fire hydrant. It's like reading their pee mail, right? I don't know if you ever heard this expression. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and what that means is that they can actually tell sort of like who's new to the neighborhood and uh, what the mood of other dogs is and, uh, you know, how recently they've been there and these kinds yeah. of incredible things. So in the case of what we did was we actually uh, created like scent molecules pouring off 
people, if they're standing in a rubble pile, you know, how does a dog know to find one person buried under the rubble right. when there's like 30 people standing on the rubble or open refrigerators or, you know, food and clothing and all these distractions? Well, what if we had all these floaty dandruffy clouds of 50 million scent molecules per minute floating off your body? Uh, and in fact, what we do in the movie was we kind of give everyone a different color so that a dog could say, OK, Wendy, I see you. And I see you and you and you, and you're blue and you're purple and you're red and you're pink. But wait a minute, there's still yellow. Yellow's coming from ah, and there's no person associated with yellow. They're under the ground. That must be what I'm after. And a dog can do that in, you know, just a couple of milliseconds. I mean, it's amazing. Um, so, so yeah, that was a lot of fun was to, and we actually take the camera right up inside the nostrils of the bloodhounds um, <laughs> and show kind of how that works and have some fun with that as well. Yeah, and those bloodhounds are amazing. I mean, they're dogs who are saving other animals yeah poachers. Was, i really wanted to not just have dogs saving people but dogs saving other animals too it's a great yeah. story uh in this case it takes place in kenya it's a great conservation success story which is at the lewa conservancy there's a pair of bloodhound brothers named tipper and tony and again uh i always start as a skeptic in 2015 i guess i flew out to meet tipper and tony and the Lewa patrol team, the anti-poaching team, and what they do is for a demo, they would uh, say, okay, Wendy, you're going to have a head start for two hours, and you're going to run, okay, across the savanna. Did and, they do that to you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so actually, we got to, they actually take, took someone, they dressed them up, and they had them run, and they lay a hot trail. So we were doing this sort of every day and getting you know, further and further away. And, and they let you, you know, take a bus or a car or whatever, you know, just to really test these dogs. Wow. So one day we showed up and no one was there. And it turned out there was a murder actually in the local village. Uh, and the dogs came in to the scene of the crime and they actually were able to track the suspect to a town and go right to a four-story apartment block and go to the door. Wow. Yes. So these dogs are like, you know, the ultimate Sherlock Holmes, yeah. you know, they're really detective dogs. And then you, I realized how much the communities depend on them in many countries in the world. I mean, the bloodhound is one of the only animals whose evidence is admissible in court. That is a good fact right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's for your next trivia night. <laughs> there you go. In fact, here, I'll give you another one. Uh, a bloodhound or, or these kind of hyper scent detection trackers have about a 95% accuracy rate in a scent lineup. So what that means is they can bottle someone's scent for up to two years, freeze it, take it out, and then have them smell it and match it to a scent lineup of suspects. You and me, Wendy, we have about a 50% accuracy rate in a sight lineup. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think I could visually identify somebody two years later, much less by smell. <laughs> yeah. So an amazing tool, and usually it works with local intelligence and that kind of thing, but they're, they're out there, they're bringing poachers to justice, they're saving rhinos and elephants, and uh, you know, uh, the, the community relies on them. So if there's a robbery or, or like in this case, a murder, uh, the dogs come in and uh, it's really amazing. They are superpower dogs. Yeah, that is so cool. Um, so you've made other giant screen films, um, and there's no such thing as a giant screen film that's easy to make. And even though it sounds like great fun making mm. a film with dogs, um, I'm sure there were challenges. So can you share um, what the particular challenges of making this film were? Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah, so many challenges. It just because uh, I think one of the things that, that your audience has to understand is that uh, the technology is unforgiving. You know, it's not just slap a camera on your shoulder and go. Uh, in, in our case, we're filming with giant 2D and 3D cameras because we have to deliver in both formats for your giant dome and for, you know, uh, uh, somewhere like the California Science Center, which is a 3D theater. And so we're doing this. But we're also uh, we want to put you in the heart of the action. Yeah. So the audience is the main character in the movie. You know, they're their protagonist, right? So every shot is a subjective shot. And you have to think about it very, very carefully. So where are you going to put the camera? Oftentimes, you're going to put it on a crane or under the water or in the air or something like that just to really create a very cinematic experience that people can't get anywhere else. Uh, and oftentimes, that could be dangerous, risky, and expensive. And, and so uh, all of this was uh, fun as you say, because we're working with dogs. But at the same time, 
you know, you're sitting waiting nine days in Whistler, British Columbia for this, the, the clouds to clear so you can do your aerials. You're working with a stunt skier who gets smoked by an avalanche at the beginning of the movie, you know, and you're setting off these avalanches with explosives and that kind of thing. So uh, it, it really is, uh, uh, you know, dangerous in that sense. And, yeah. and uh, uh, there's a lot of, you know, our crews are huge. You know, we're sometimes up to 100 people, multiple vehicles, uh, stabilization equipment. And so there's a lot that goes into it. We don't want the audience to notice that. We don't want it to be cumbersome. But we want to give you an experience that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah, and that definitely happens. And the, that footage is stunning, <laughs> stunning. Wow. Um, do you want to tell us a behind the scenes story of making oh, uh, the film? Yeah, I've got so many. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, well, here's one that's really fun, actually. Is So we're working in Italy and we're working with these uh, Newfoundlands, you know, these beautiful, huge, fluffy dogs who are like the kind of drooly. Little yeah, drooly. they're a little drooly, <laughs> but uh, you got to love the drool. Yeah. The drool is a superpower it's part itself. Of them. Yeah. So, um, we're working with these Newfoundlands who are like the diesel engines of the sea. You know, they can tow up to 50 times their weight in the water. Um, yeah. And they actually deploy from helicopter, from boats. Uh, they tend to calm people who are in situations where like their boat may have capsized. And they tend to save about 20 to 30 people uh, every year. Um, and there's a group called the Italian School of, of Water Rescue Dogs. And uh, it's pretty amazing stuff. So we're there and I wanted a scene that would showcase the power of the Newfoundland. And so I talked to uh, Ferruccio Palinga, who's the he leads the school, and he has this amazing dog in the movie called Reef, who's this beautiful uh, four-year-old Newfoundland. And Ferruccio actually got the idea to start this school because his own daughter nearly drowned when she was six. And his dog, a Newfoundland named Mass, jumped in and saved her. Wow, just naturally without oh, any yeah. training. And that's the thing. These dogs have a natural rescue instinct, an inclination to, you know, even if you're maybe not driving, you're splashing a lot. The dog will jump in and try and save you, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, but in this case, it really did work, and it changed his life, and he started the school, uh, and he felt like he really wanted to give back and show people what these dogs could do. And so you have a lot of dogs that have these webbed paws, uh, like Labradors and, and, and different water dogs. So we're in Italy, and I was trying to film a sequence where a dog would be towing something very heavy. Yeah. Uh, and I turn around and I see Reef with uh, uh, like a dinghy of other dogs, like puppies that are in training. And she takes the rope in her mouth and she just starts swimming, like going away. And the thing is, it could have gone so horribly wrong. And so we're just trying to chase this and get the crane down and film this. <laughs> and everyone's laughing. And my crew's saying, man, if you get the shot, this is making the trailer for sure. And it's in there. It's in the movie. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's totally. She's just <laughs> motoring with these dogs. And they're all sitting there, like, hanging out pretty cool until one of them just goes, that's it. I've had it. And just dives out. Yes. It's really cute. <laughs> it's super cute. I mean, a dog and a boat full of dogs. Yeah. No, and I have one more that I just have to share, which is that yeah. we filmed uh, the avalanche rescue scene. Uh, so Henry's our avalanche rescue dog. Yeah. And he is just exudes cool. He is like the James Bond of dogs. He is. Yeah. He is super cool. So he wears these... Uh, goggles. Like yeah. Well, we call them doggles, right? Doggles. So, yeah. All right. <laughs> case, so he wears these amazing red uh, goggles and, and you'll see him. He's on the poster and yeah, he's quite iconic. But in any case, he rides a snowmobile and he does all kinds of things like that. And <laughs> and so they actually deploy... Uh, Henry and Ian deploy into the back country of British Columbia on helicopter. What that means is by long lines. So they're suspended underneath the helicopter on a cable. Yeah. And that's the fastest way in. So if something happens, it's a vast area, boom, they go in, they get deployed, they get picked up and moved in. And I wanted to open the movie with this kind of a scene. But it, uh, you know, weather didn't cooperate and we're trying to chase weather and get patches of sunlight and everything. So we did a lot of flying around with the dog and human dangling from the helicopter oh <laughs> and so at the end of the day i was just so apologetic and i'm so sorry ian and henry oh gosh you guys are so courageous and you must hate me and ian says to me you know what actually no i want to thank you because i've never felt so close to my dog you know we get deployed like this all the time but we are suspended in midair over some of the most gorgeous countryside you could ever see we don't hear the helicopter it's a completely serene experience for us and i looked down at my dog and i said you know henry if not for you, buddy, I would never be here. And at that moment, the dog looks up at him and he says, I swear he was saying the same thing. <laughs> ah, true partnership. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. 
That's what it's about. It's about the human animal bond. You yeah. know, and that's what moved me the most is that you see the relationship of these handlers to their dogs. Yeah. And it speaks to the bond we all have with our pets as well. So, you know, part of the message is you don't have to be fighting crime and saving lives. You know, every dog has superpowers and they make us feel uh, less lonely and they improve our lives in countless ways. Uh, any pet owner will tell you this. And so it's kind of like the ultimate, very dramatic celebration of a universal message, uh, which is that pets make our world better. Is that what your hoping audiences will take from the film? Um, it's certainly one message that I hope. I mean, there's lots of messages. I mean, part of me, uh, I also want um, non-dog people to come to see the movie too. So love for cat lovers to come and for people who maybe don't have a pet. And so I just don't there want... Might, there might be one cat in the There film. is, in fact, a cat. <laughs> I had, because I'm actually a cat person. So not that I, I love dogs too, but I've just, I've had cats. And so uh, I had to throw a cat in there. So you yeah. got to stay all the way to the end of the movie if you want to see the cat. That's all I'll say. Yes. Um, <laughs> and it's worth it. <laughs> and there's also a great song. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, the sublime song. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so uh, I just I want it to be sort of universal. So uh, initially, I kind of went in thinking, okay, this is great, good concept, dogs are the real superheroes, let's go. But by the end of making it, I sort of felt actually what it is is it's the right dog paired with the right human. Yeah, that's what makes. And even Cat says that in the movie. It's this incredible team effort. And you know, I think that part of the movie is about raising children, actually, as well as raising a dog. You know. Uh, it's all about positive reinforcement and compassion. And I think it's got such a sort of joyous message uh, that's uplifting that I think there's a lot more than just, you know, your typical dog movie. That's That was our goal in making it. And, and I hope that people come out of it and they see their pets in a new way and they want to learn more about, you know, sort of the science of, of, of dogs and, and pets in general. But also, look, let's face it, Wendy. I mean, we have work in this, in this world and these museums and, and pets are sort of like the first world window into the natural world for a lot of young people yeah true uh so i think sometimes we know all the benefits of pets and they they you know help to uh, improve the social fabric and keep you healthy and happy and all these things but i think they also are great teachers yeah they really teach us a lot about ourselves um and and and, you know our capacity maybe for empathy and understanding you know because we're trying to be the best humans we can be and and you know i like to think that our dogs kind of bring that out of us as well well yeah there's that quote you know i want to be the person my dog thinks i am (laughs) and so yeah that's definitely definitely a thing and i went home and i hugged my dog and told him that he was my hero so oh that's great i'm so glad to hear that yeah i've had so many people come up and say man you made me miss my dog you know and that's kind of it is there's (laughs) something in it i think for everyone that you just feel closer to your to your to your partner Although, watch out. So I, I know someone um, who saw the film and then um, and didn't have a dog and um, then went and adopted a dog <laughs> because she was so inspired by the film. So I think there will be a rush on adoptions. I mean, you never know what the impact of these movies is that whether uh, young people decide to pursue careers in veterinary science yeah. or become, you know, serpent search and rescue or just find a way to work with animals. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think shelters and, and other places will see a natural interest. And that's why Chris Evans actually appears at the end of the movie. Uh, it was yeah, really so that's important. Captain America. Yes. He's the narrator. He does a fantastic job. No, I was really happy. I mean, that's the dream is you want a celebrity who is going to engage. So actually, when we built that set at the beginning, because we open with the first image you see is Captain America, Black Widow and all these Marvel characters. Right. Yeah. And you've got this kid who's in the bed who's comic book obsessed and you know meanwhile he's got the real superhero on the edge of his bed that's kind of the message and by the end you know that whole learning arc is complete where now the dogs get their full recognition but uh when we filmed that i was thinking oh gosh wouldn't it be great if dot 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 you know we could get steve rogers captain america you know chris chris evans yeah. who's a known dog enthusiast I mean, anyone who follows on social media knows that he posts about dodger and you know he's he's a dog guy so actually when he came in to do the voice recording session uh we brought henry uh into the session and so he kind of he came in and he was very professional and everything and then he saw the dog in the corner he was just melted he was like, hey buddy <laughs> Oh my God. So it was just the right move. And it put him in such a good mood, actually. Uh, and he was very generous. And then he did this message where he just says, look, uh, you know, you're going to watch this movie. You're going to want to rush out and get a dog like Henry or these other working dogs. But just do your research, you know, pick the right dog for you and your family. And it's such an important message uh, to get right, which is one of the messages of, of Mars Pet Care is one of the sponsors of the film yeah. is, uh, 
is, you know, just find the right partner for you. That's so critical. And it's a big decision. Um, and it's life changing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And there's wonderful dogs and shelters waiting for homes. So there's plenty of dogs out there looking Absolutely. for a great home. Absolutely. So this isn't your first rodeo. You've done many giant screen films. Um, Jerusalem was a big hit here, and that was one of your fine films. Um, how many giant screen films have you made? I've done several, actually. I This is my second IMAX film as a director. Mm -hmm. uh, so before that, I was a line producer and a screenwriter. Uh, and I love the format. You know, I've done a number of different films, but... Um, uh, Jerusalem was equally challenging and for all kinds of different reasons. And funnily enough, dogs maybe grew out of that because uh, we so wanted to, uh, you know, I think these films can change the world. I mean, it sounds very naive, but it, I really believe it. And, uh, you know, that film was so much about bridging the gap between all these different uh, perspectives on that city and, and, and you know, tolerance and plur pluralism and all these wonderful things. Um, and it's so funny because then you come in and you do a film like dogs and you know, you really are in a sense, these dogs are saving the world, you know, it's yeah. the same thing. So it's a totally different kind of approach at this. Uh, and uh, you know, I love this format, you know, it's the best format there is. It's just pure cinema and when it's really working and when you treat it um, as it's as a as special format that it is this large format, it's just so immersive. And yes, the films are, are 45 minutes, but if you do it right, you know, an audience can walk out of these movies with a totally different perspective on the world and their place in it. Uh, and that's not something that uh, I don't I don't know if you can get that from other uh, medium. So I, I think that it's something that, look, you guys have been around for 46, 46 years. We and don't look a day over 30, though. This is true. <laughs> yep. Something about this room, actually. This must be it. So uh, I just, I think that whatever the subject is, you know, you've got to ask yourself these questions of, but how do I do this in a way that's novel, in a way that delivers on the promise of the giant screen, in a way that, uh, you know, moves the camera. Let's face it, every time the camera moves, the whole theater is moving. Yeah. And you've got to sort of take that into consideration. So, yes, I've made films about uh, the holy places of Jerusalem. Uh, I've made films on elephants and wolves and biodiversity. I made a film on the human brain that took place in the Tour de France. Uh, you know, every film is so different. And they're like these, uh, um, you know, theses on different subjects. you got to know it. you got to research it. That's why they're fun to make because it's like you read so much. You meet all these incredible people. And by the end of it, you're, you're changed uh, yourself. And that's why documentaries are, are great. They're satisfying to make. Uh, and you get to interact with the audience too uh, as opposed to, say, making a, a feature that comes for opening weekend and you just impress and then it's gone. These films have a long shelf life. You guys just had oh, yeah. a film festival mm -hmm. and some of the films on there are, you know, 20 plus years old uh, and they're still quite relevant. So we all hope to make that evergreen film that's going to resonate uh, years later and people will say, I remember that part where the space shuttle does this or whatever it is or where I first saw that, you know, octopus swimming or whatever. People have those memories of... And, and, you know, sometimes I just, I remember my first IMAX experience uh, quite vividly. I know it was, uh, I saw Titanica and Grand Canyon in some double bill and it just, you know, sort of blew my mind, you know. Uh, my, I grew up, I love 2001 A Space Odyssey, Lawrence of Arabia. So grand, large format was yeah. something that I absolutely adored. Uh, and I think, you know, especially now where... Uh, our our attention is 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 always on you know devices and Netflix and this kind of thing, uh, to keep that theatrical experience really special, um, the way that someone like Christopher Nolan does by using the format and yeah. so that you just say wow uh, we've got to keep that wow factor in what we do otherwise we're going to lose the audience so we have to pick our subjects carefully, uh, find novel ways to tell these stories to move people, to put real emotion into them. Authenticity is something that's really important, that's different from this format, because uh, the audience is very sophisticated. They know when you're faking it. Uh, right. And even kids, you know, I have my daughters will say like, Daddy, is that real or CGI? And so their level, what they're mm -hmm. expecting out of a museum film or a film that they might see at the fleet or somewhere else is very different. Um, and these films don't have to be dry or pedagogical or whatever, they can be fun and, and immersive because there's so much learning going on to that giant screen. It just doesn't have to be, um, you know, information just, just pounded into you. A lot of it is just visual. 
you know, you get to be a dog or you get to uh, swim with a whale or whatever it is. Right. Um, so just to keep that immersive nature in mind. And, and, and I, I just hope more uh, young filmmakers um, come in and pick it up and learn it uh, because it's so special. Uh, if we're not careful, we'll lose it. I, I love this format. Me too. I sure do. So what's next for you? Well, uh, a number of things. I'm actually, I've been working on a movie about uh, Einstein and his brain. So like, how did he think and his imagination and creativity? So we all know, and we know him as a genius and it's very esoteric, but uh, I was invited after we did Jerusalem by the Hebrew University of Jerusalem to um, try and develop a movie uh, for IMAX screens about how to think like Einstein. And so this is a tough one as well, because it's like, oh gosh, does that really belong on the giant screen? And then I started to realize that Einstein's thought experiments, so I don't know if people know about Einstein's, that he would do these elaborate thought experiments in his head. You know, what would happen if I raced a beam of light or if I was falling in the space elevator and it's kind of things like that. And then the way he thought about problems was so very unique and so very visual. I thought, wow, we could really translate that. We could use the giant screen in this way that the audience gets to be Einstein. And then we could actually look at his legacy in the 21st century. So we could actually meet, say, uh, astrophysicists today who are actually proving his theories from 100 years ago. Right. Yes. So because that is happening. It is. And look at, I mean, gravitational waves. He wrote about mm -hmm. it in 1916. And you've got, uh, you know, LIGO, advanced LIGO that has detected all kinds of things, gravitational waves, the collision of black holes and so forth. So uh, some of Einstein's theories are still... You know, his field equations are still being tested. And I, I'd love to make a movie for uh, all ages uh, about what it's like to think like Einstein, to think like an astrophysicist, to think like a quote unquote genius. Yeah. You know, it doesn't mean that you have to have a certain IQ and you have to have a certain education. It just means this ability to visualize yeah. in novel ways. And that's very powerful, you know, that you can imagine what if. What might happen if? So I'm sort of working on this idea. We actually filmed the total solar eclipse in 2017 uh, with 26 different camera units across the path of totality because, of course, it was during a total solar eclipse that uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity was proven in 1919. And so we did this kind of almost 100-year celebration, recreation of that original experiment um, and Very so, cool. so I filmed that and I'm waiting kind of, it's another one of these protracted multi-year projects that I just need it to be very different and special and immersive. So that's yeah. one. Yeah. Like I said, there's no easy uh, giant screen film to make. Yeah. You better choose your subjects <laughs> wisely because you're going to be on it for a while. Yeah. You better really like it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. We're super excited to have Superpower Dogs in the Highcoff Giant Dome Theater here at the Fleet Science Center playing daily. So definitely come and see it. Yeah, please do. And see it in its intended format. You know, uh, it's the kind of thing where I, I don't think the television equivalent is the same. You know, it's meant to be immersive. And uh, this is a great place to see it. So come to the Fleet. The exhibits are fantastic. You know, make a day of it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks, Fleetsters. Bye. <laughs>